Hello and welcome to Pre-Hospital Induction of Therapeutic Hypothermia. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the president of Ed for Nurses, where we empower nurses to become extraordinary. This is part of our two-minute EBP challenge. Our two-minute EBP challenge is one quick and easy way for you to stay up to date on what's happening in nursing. To sign up for free and get it into your email box, just go to edfornurses.com and you can get your own copy of the two-minute EBP challenge. Every Friday comes out an email that tells you a question question or ask you a question, you can respond back to that question, and then on Monday you get the answer along with the video. Also, you can connect with us on Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash edfornurses or just go to your Facebook account and search for Ed for Nurses, and you'll find our page there where we maintain a blog, and it helps you to connect with us and find out more about what's happening in the nursing field. But today, let's talk a little bit about cardiac arrest and how therapeutic hypothermia is going to be helpful to our patients. What happens when a patient has cardiac arrest is obviously the first thing is that the heart stops beating. Next, we get decrease in perfusion. So the perfusion that is going to the heart and to all the other vital organs is going to be decreased, including the brain. So the brain is not getting as much perfusion as it normally would. Then we go through a process of ischemia, injury, and necrosis to the brain. So we get ischemic injury to the brain that is causing some long-term neurologic dysfunction in our patient. If this dysfunction is global enough, or large enough and long enough, then the patient could really have long-term disability or may not be able to be resuscitated at all. Lastly, we can end up having reperfusion injury. Okay, it would sound like all right, if the patient's ischemic and not getting any oxygen to the brain, wouldn't it make sense that giving them some oxygen to the brain would be a good thing? Well, not always the case. When we start to reperfuse tissue that has not been perfused for a while, we can get reperfusion injuries. Now, just to give you an idea, maybe you can relate to this. Have you ever slept wrong and you wake up in the morning and your arm's asleep? Now, before you get back to normal type of feeling in the arm, you're going to have that pins and needles kind of thing, right? That's the reperfusion. You're reperfusing an area that was ischemic, and now what's happening is you're having abnormal sensation and abnormal use in that limb until it fully wakes kind of back up again. Now, the same thing can happen here with the brain. If we have decreased perfusion, we get ischemia, injury, and necrosis to the brain, and then suddenly we start giving it oxygen... That oxygen is going to get converted into things called oxygen-free radicals, and those oxygen-free radicals are going to cause more damage to the brain. So giving them oxygen actually makes it worse to some extent. Now, these processes that occur with this perfusion injury or reperfusion injury and the ischemic injury and all those things, a lot of those things that are occurring to the brain during cardiac arrest are temperature sensitive. So if we induce hypothermia in our patient, first of all, it'll help to slow perfusion through the body. So hopefully we'll get better uptake of oxygen to those tissues. It decreases metabolism. And in fact, it can decrease brain metabolism by about 6 to 8% per 1 degree Celsius that we are lowering the body temperature. On average, we're going to be lowering it about 2 or 3 degrees, so maybe even 4 degrees in some patients. So you can see we could have a dramatic decrease in metabolism that's occurring here. The third thing that occurs that is a great benefit is decreased ischemic injury. Okay, remember, some of those processes that were occurring before causing the damage are temperature sensitive. Now, when we start to lower the temperature a little bit, now there's not as much ischemic ischemic injury that's occurring. And then lastly, we also get a decrease in our reperfusion injury. So a lot of great benefits that are happening here as a result of inducing a mild hypothermia in our patient who suffered a cardiac arrest. So who benefits? Who are we going to use this for? Typically right now, Primarily, we're using it for patients who have out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, V-fib cardiac arrest, and in the study that we're talking about today, non-V-fib cardiac arrest outside the hospital. There's also been some studies looking at using therapeutic hypothermia in patients who are brain injured or even patients who've had strokes. Now, there isn't good guidelines yet for this. We're still getting some data back and some research back, so don't get too excited, but that's on the horizon. So pretty soon, we might be using hypothermia also in your patient who's had a stroke. So how do we do this? How do we go about making a patient hypothermic so that they can hopefully have a better outcome? 
Well, there's a number of different ways we can do this. We can use cooling blankets and caps, and what's shown here in the picture is a device, the Arctic Sun, that's going to help us to be able to cool the patient down with a cooling blanket. Another possibility is a cooling cap. It goes over the head and it cools the patient's head. Well, we lose a lot of our heat through the head, so that might be a good way to induce some hypothermia in our patients. Other studies have looked at using ice packs, just packing the groin and the axilla with ice packs packs to help to decrease the body temperature. Some of them have used this in combination. They found that cooling blankets sometimes are just not effective enough at getting that body temperature down. So instead what they're going to do is pack the patient with ice and the cooling blanket. After the patient reaches the target temperature of about 34 to 32 degrees, then we remove the ice packs so that the cooling blanket can maintain that target temperature. In the study we're talking about today, they used iced IV fluids out in the field to help to cool the patient before the patient reached the emergency department. So that's another possibility. The problem with iced IV fluids is it's going to cause venous vasoconstriction, which could cause some additional complications or problems in our patients. So iced IV fluids, that's obviously a possibility. Lastly is cooling catheters. I'm going to show you an example of one of these here in just a minute. Again, our goal is we want to try to get that patient's body temperature down to 32 to 34 degrees Celsius for about 24 hours, and then we'll go through an eight-hour rewarming phase. So you see, we don't just warm that patient right back up again and get them right back to normal. There's going to be a rewarming phase, and this helps to decrease the amount of secondary injury that's occurring to the brain. This is an example of one of the types of devices that's available that helps to cool the patient down through the central venous blood. So this catheter is inserted in the femoral vein and it goes up into the central circulation and it has uh, a couple different pieces on here. One of them is it has a particular port that just ports in this cool fluid. So cool fluid gets ported in and it's kind of hard to see from our picture here, but there's a catheter, there's like a balloon around the outside of this catheter that contains the cold fluid. So the cold fluid's in our central circulation, it's going to cool the central circulation, and it's going to cool a lot faster and more effectively than these other types of devices that we've talked about. So that's certainly one possibility if your hospital is definitely considering doing a lot of therapeutic hypothermia, this would definitely be something that you might want to look into because it is a very easy way to control the patient's body temperature. It senses the core temperature and can maintain it where you want it to be. Also good for rewarming the patient, okay? So we can start putting some warm fluid in that catheter and rewarm the patient with that catheter as well. and can control the process very well since we are controlling the temperature of our central venous blood flow. Now be careful if you're going to induce therapeutic hypothermia in any of your patients. We have to have central temperature monitoring. It's not good enough to monitor an oral temperature or axillary temperature or something like that. We have to have a central temperature monitor in place, which means a PA catheter or Foley catheter or some other kind of central type of temperature monitoring device. The patient needs to be paralyzed, especially if we're going to cool the patient with some of these external devices. The external devices are going to cause a lot more shivering than the internal devices do. A mean arterial pressure of greater than 80 should be maintained in order to maintain cerebral perfusion in our patient. Watch for bradycardia, a very common situation that occurs in patients who are being cooled. And it's not a big deal, even a heart rate of 40 is not a big deal, so long as hemodynamically the patient is otherwise maintaining their pressures and perfusion. Watch for hypokalemia. Temperature swings are going to move potassium back and forth. As we cool the patient, potassium moves back into the cell. As we rewarm the patient, potassium starts to come back out again. So you need to be very careful about potassium when your patient is having hypothermia or therapeutic hypothermia. Control the blood glucose. High blood glucoses are not good for the brain when the patient is in this kind of situation. So we want to control that glucose well when we're using therapeutic hypothermia. Well, in our study, what they found was in the patients that had pre-hospital cooling, we had about 17% of those patients leave the hospital with favorable outcomes, meaning they had a good neurologic outcome. When we waited until we got the patient to the hospital, then tried cooling, we saw about a 7% 
patient population with favorable outcomes, good neurologic outcomes. Okay, this was not statistically significant. However, we do see that there is definitely a trend here. And some of these values here are a little bit different than other studies that have been done that have showed more favorable results with cooling. So it may have to do with the way that they were doing the cooling using iced solution rather than maybe using a central venous catheter. The take-home points are that therapeutic hypothermia appears to improve outcomes, but we still have much to learn, and protocols need to be standardized. Before you start to do therapeutic hypothermia on any of your patients, make sure that you have a protocol in place. There's a lot of little things that need to be in place, so we don't want those things to get out of place and have some problems. He says, Scott, it's Oates. I think he's died of indecent exposure. We certainly don't want your patients to be overexposed and get too cold. So this is a very well-controlled process. It's not something that we're just going to kind of do willy-nilly because that can cause additional complications and we're not going to get the benefit that we hope to get. This is an article from Dr. Bernard and colleagues from Critical Care Medicine entitled Induction of Pre-Hospital Therapeutic Hypothermia After Resuscitation from Non-Ventricular Fibrillation Cardiac Arrest. And you can find it in the February, I'm sorry, March issue of Critical Care Medicine from this year. Now, if you'd like to get nursing tips, you can get them sent right to your cell phone by texting to 86677 and put in the body of your text, Nursing Tips. Once a week, you'll get a nursing tip sent right to your cell phone. Okay, so you don't even have to go look for it. It comes right to you. Only one a week so we don't run up big text charges on your cell phone. But if you'd like to get those, this is a service of Ed for Nurses. Text 86679 and put in the body of your text, Nursing Tips. Well, thank you for joining me this week for pre-hospital induction of therapeutic hypothermia. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the president of Ed for Nurses, where we empower nurses to become extraordinary. Thanks again for joining me this week, and until next time, bye now.